So Matt and Wade, you guys were on the show back in 2020 on episode, I've got it here in front of me, 272. And we're up to 500 and something now. It's great to see you guys again. My first question is this, how long have you two been friends? Over 20 years. Yeah, I guess we've met sort of back in 97. Mm -hmm. And then our, our friendship really kind of emerged in 2000, the end of 2000. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's been long, a progression from And there. how long have you been business partners? Since 2004, 2004. Wow. I ask that because I've observed, and it's also been my personal experience, that partnerships don't always work out. <laughs> Well, we definitely went to hell and back. Did yeah. you? Oh, yeah. You guys have been through some shit? Yeah. Yeah. Because anytime I've been around you two at you know, various events and our prior recording and whatnot, um, you seem to be copacetic and have a really good chemistry and just can tell you have different personalities that are likely complementary. How have you dealt with conflict and disagreements over the years as business partners? One of the reasons I, I got into business with Matt is been a series of circumstances where I saw that Matt, no matter what was going on, would continue to take action regardless of if there was failure or mistakes or things didn't work out. And I, I realized he had the resilience that it would take to be successful at pretty much anything that he was willing to do. And I resonated with that. And I thought, well, kind of the same attitude. So, okay, that's a guy that's not going to quit. He's not going to give up. And anybody that gets into business understands that you're going to go through a lot of difficulties. And I think in a partnership, the advantage that a partnership provides are wonderful, but innately there are going to be significant differences in maybe the direction or how you want to do things or who takes responsibility for one thing and, and, you know, it's back and forth. I don't think we would have made it without, we talked about Dr. David Hawkins and the map of consciousness and our commitment to spiritual evolution. And also our commitment to the people that we're trying to assist in the journey. So I think those two elements uh, are enough to kind of overcome the, you know, the one's own egoic tendencies. And I have a strong ego and, and is a personality and it's an, it's an interface device. And uh, <laughs> like, you, you, you start to understand that. You put it in the proper context, I think, with the map of consciousness with David Hawkins. And we're both big advocates and followers of that philosophy. Matt, maybe you want to add to that? Yeah, you actually, I didn't know you knew Clayton. Clayton's been a huge influence in both Wade and I's life. And when we were in absolute war, Clayton actually mediated us out of it. So we hired him and he really helped us, which was great. But I think the thing that's helped the most has been just doing a lot of emotional processing. I mean, Wade's done, I think, five or six brain trainings. I've done nine. So I've done five or 600 rounds of forgiveness or resets. I use EFT. And I think it has been a lot of things I've had to clear, whether it's directly related to Wade or not. And, you know, I don't react anymore. I mean, I, I, it's been a long time since things hit me that causes reactions. If you think about a fight, it's typically someone reacts and the other person reacts to the reaction, just kind of this spiraling descent into implosion. So both of us have done enough work that it's not happening anymore. That's amazing. Well, it's been cool to see your success. I mean, with bioptimizers, I don't know if I met you guys right when you started, but <clears throat> I don't think you had as many products and you didn't have the Newtopia, you know, arm of it. Mark, I, as you sure you guys know, was on the show. Really great guy, by the way. <laughs> I love that. He's dude. awesome. He was really fun. I was thinking of texting him yesterday because he's like, if you ever need help with business, you know, I've been CEO of a hundred companies or whatever the hell. And I kind of logged that in my memory and I had I had a question that I needed answered yesterday. I might hit him up. But yeah, just watching you guys you know, steadily grow and seem to do it in a way that's uh, sustainable and smart. And, you know, I work with so many different brands and I kind of, I think sometimes can see like, ah, you guys are, you know, diversifying too much or putting out too many different products or going in different directions. And 
couple of them that I've had that feeling about have folded because they just get distracted or maybe the founders don't have the spiritual foundation of shared values. So the personalities kind of come in and get in the way and if someone wants to be right and someone wants their way and you know, I think it's easy to forget in some cases that um, if you're both going in the same direction and you're committed to that, you don't necessarily have to be on the exact same road, right? It's like you know, <clears throat> parallel roads. Now, this is kind of how I look at my marriage, parallel roads that are very different in the um, general way that they look and feel, but they're going in the same direction. So even if there's a divergence, you know that you're coming back together because you're both going to the same place. Yeah, I think Wade and I both have gone through that with nutrition. I mean, our, the thing we share is a passion for helping people get healthier. We were both trainers. That's where we met, built a friendship, and you know that's that's what's guided us with all the product development. I think we're both obsessed with creating best in class products or best in class customer experience, best in class customer support, and those foundational things that have allowed us to to thrive. I think I heard one of you guys, I forget which one it was, on one of the David Hawkins talks. Are you aware that one of you are on one of the recordings? Yeah, we've been on both. You both, both been, been on, on yeah. yeah, I've, I've been on the video series. I think I'm on three or four times where you get the question and answer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because I've listened to, I don't know, thousands of hours of those things. And then after meeting you guys, I recognize your voice. And every once in a while, I'll go back and I'll be like, oh, that was those guys. <laughs> Just funny. The couple of times I went to see him speak, I was too lazy and shy to, to wait in line and go up on stage and ask him questions. And then I saw his last talk before he died. And that I don't have many regrets in life, but I do regret not just making my way to the stage and just looking in his eyes and just being, you know, in the presence of someone at that level. It's a powerful experience, life-changing. Yeah. It really felt like you were just looking at consciousness. Yeah, I get that sense because a lot of the times, I'm sure you guys have observed, maybe you had this experience, someone would have this really uh, impactful, complex, intellectual question. <laughs> And they would come up and start to ask the question and then they would just start laughing and the question just totally lost its relevance mm -hmm. yeah, because of the energy field. And they're just like, oh, actually, I'm just supposed to be sitting here experiencing the field. The question becomes insignificant in the presence. I would even feel that in line, like while you're in line getting to the stage, I was trying to just think of questions and it, all of them just felt irrelevant. Yeah, it's I funny. Asking a really stupid marketing question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the process, I, w when I was in the process of asking questions, there was a surface communication that's happening in front of the audience, but it felt like thousands of questions and their derivatives are coming out of your field and thousands of answers are coming back and your brain simply can't process the sheer magnitude of the information and it, and it starts to unpack over time. So there was a surface communication, but there's this other kind of knowingness experience that happens. And sometimes it's so overwhelming, people would just go silent or, <laughs> yeah. or you know, ask about their cat or, you know, yeah, so some, yeah. some would seem almost, you know, humorous or bizarre or unusual. And then you, as I went so many different times, I would see that happening over and over and having those experiences. It's like, oh, okay. I get what's happening. I, I could see what was happening with the person a little bit more empathetically. It's like, oh yeah, they're in the field and they're getting obliterated right now. So they're just yeah, fumbling with whatever. Totally. Well, thinking back on the, I remember the question I wanted to ask because he would calibrate the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and groups, as you guys know, and would kind of explain why they were effective. <clears throat> but at the time I was really into studying all of that literature and I was really deeply into the book 12 Steps and 12 Traditions known as uh, the 12 and 12. And he never talked about that book. So that was going to be my question is like, have you calibrated that particular book or calibrated each of the steps? Because that book was so helpful to me and kind of going deeper in the application of those principles beyond just, oh, I don't drink anymore. You know, that really explained things, but it's kind of like a hidden gem in those circles and that was going to be my question but in hindsight now it's like well what does it matter right it just it wouldn't have really changed anything in my life because i was still applying the same teachings regardless of what their calibration was i definitely wanted to ask you guys about the hawkins thing that was on my list 
Let's start out. Tell us about this book, you guys. And we're going to talk a lot about a lot of things, but I know you guys want to talk about your book. And for people watching on video, I got this box when I came back in town yesterday and I was like, what? The end of the diet war starts now. And I recognize the Bioptimizer's little emblem on there and I open it up and I'm like, this has got to be the most clever book marketing packaging for those again on the video you can see the book comes in this box and you open it up and it's got utensils you know indicative of a book on uh on diets and And it's engraved if you can you can actually see the engraving on the utensils hashtag oh really and the diet war oh my god well it i didn't even know this is what we're going to be talking about until a couple days ago i just could always find things to talk to you guys about but that idea of diet wars i was like oh i'm all in we got to talk about this because and the book by the way is called the ultimate nutrition bible for those uh that want to know the real title but i've often said on the show you know in the beginning i think i would you know i'd have i don't know dave asprey or stephen gundry and different people that had different perspectives on on diets and i'd interview people that were plant-based rich roll and then paul saladino carnivore after so many years in the wellness space, I just have arrived at a place where I'm just, I'm so over diets. <laughs> There's just, there is no like right diet is where I've arrived. And people ask me, you know, what diet do you follow? I'm like, I hate diets. I don't do diets. I just eat the things that I tend to feel good on. And I try to avoid the things that I don't feel good on. Um, so that was a, 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 an immediate hook for me. But to be honest, I haven't had a chance to dive into this massive Bible that's like 18 inches tall. So I'm kind of coming at this a bit green. So maybe we could start with kind of what the motivation was to write yet another diet book that is not a diet book. And and I asked that on the heels of doing a little research. Uh, According to the Nielsen book scan, about 5 million diet books are sold each year. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And I don't know how long that's been going on, but I, I see them come and go. Yet our mortality is getting worse and people are sicker and sicker. So I'm like, okay, well, we have such an abundance of diet books out there and different approaches to eating, yet we're getting sicker as a civilization. So maybe it's not all about diet. So what um, motivated you guys to enter you know, a paradigm breaking way of writing a book that is anti-diet yet gives you some tips on how to eat well so we both survived our diet war we're both recovered dietary dogmatic zealots wade was a i'd say plant-based zealot i was a ketogenic zealot i've been doing ketogenic diet for 30 years with over 20 years on the plant-based side vegetarian side and we literally argued i mean i don't know for how many years how many hours and at some point, we, re- we realized we were both successful with our clients. We were both trainers. And, and then there was clients we were both failing with. I remember my first ketogenic client that I failed with, like his skin turned gray. He looked horrible, felt horrible. And I didn't understand. I thought everybody should be on a ketogenic diet. So slowly, we started realizing that there's universal nutritional optimizers, things like gut biome, nutrigenomics, eliminating food allergy sensitivities. We can get into the, the nuances, but there's certain things everybody can do that will improve their performance on their diet. But the three core questions that we want to ask everyone is, is this the right diet for you? Is this the right diet for you right now? Because our goals change. And are you doing it the best way possible? So what we've done is we've created really a unifying nutritional philosophy that transcends the dietary tribal dynamics and maybe Wade, you can talk about just the dietary tribes we've seen out there. Yeah. I I mean, first the data, 97% of people who engage in a diet will eventually gain all the weight back. It's starting weight loss is only one avenue that you can address. There's muscle gain, there's cognitive health, there's longevity, endurance. There's, there's a variety of parameters. So first and foremost, you have to understand what's my goal and your diet needs to reflect your goal. Two, what is my genetics? And like, am I genetically predisposed to being successful on a plant-based diet? Or am I like Jordan Peterson, who, 
you know, can only eat meat because he has a, an, an unusual genetic condition that his daughter both ha that has as well that, you know, ex ex excludes a lot of potential foods. So there's no sense of condemning that. And then, of course, what lifestyle fits within our nutritional pyramid of decisions. And we'll get into that in a minute. But what happens and what we've observed, because we've been around this for a long time. We both got into this in our teenage years. So collectively, we have over 60 years of dietary experience. And you see the what I call the rise and fall of dietary dogmatic. And what happens is, for whatever reason, the dietary philosophy catches hold. Uh, a charismatic leader steps into the position, creates the, the do's and don'ts, and starts the book and the seminars and the products and the supporting cast of the usual things. And, and there's an amygdala center in our brain that is always looking at where do I fit within the tribe? So part of being a human is belonging to something and being part of a dietary tribe, especially in those early stages when most diets will work for a while. We talk about that, the, the change and some of the optimization and maybe a new level of discipline and awareness that you put into a dietary strategy will produce results. But if you're going against some of the key elements in the pyramid of nutritional decisions, eventually you revert back. We haven't seen anybody address that. And then what happens? You have a bell curve of distribution. In other words, the, two percent, the top two percenters, they're the advocates, you know, they cured some disease, they lost 50 pounds, they made $500 million on a new thing. Like, it's everything that you would want. And that's all the people that are, you know, advocating and testimonials and all that stuff. Then there's the 2%, you know, typing in on whatever social media with the, with the haterade parade. You know, like, I, you know, I, I gained 40 pounds, my lipids went through the roof, I got some bizarre disease. And then, and then comes the, you know, the part, but then I found this, you know, and it's, it's another cult-like religion that evolves about some other charismatic leader who solved the same problems that they had. And now they become the top two percentile. And then you see the battles going back and forth. And so Matt and I were a mini, a mini version of that, but we both shared the same passions and we want to connect with people to recognize. We want people to be successful. We want people to be healthy. We've never lost sight of the individual and how much joy we get when someone, you know, solves that problem forever. And so we decided we'd put together a choose your own adventure, identifying where people go wrong, how to avoid being limited by a cult-like mentality. And so that you're armed with the defense mechanisms that you're not, you know, stuck in some sort of paradigm that doesn't suit you over the long term. And I think we've done a great job on this book. And I think it's going to be able to create a talking point for opposing dietary philosophies to kind of come together where people can share the insights to be successful, not just for today or not just for 12 weeks, but for, you know, lock it in for life and enjoy the process. There's so many good points in there, you guys. The, I think one of the things that turns me off about the diet trends, and like you guys see, these sort of things get rebranded and come in and out of vogue over and over again um, for you know a couple of decades now. But I think it's the, the tribal identification and how people... And I'm not saying like I'm I'm you know observing this from above, and I've never been prone to it. I've been through all kinds of misidentifications in my life before I knew who I was as my own weird, unique self. But it's like the if you let's say someone is a proponent of the carnivore diet or a vegan diet, if you ask questions or push back on some of their philosophy or beliefs around that it's as if that person themselves is being attacked rather than an, ob an objective idea, right? It's, it's just part of that human nature, right? That we become so identified with something that isn't actually us, that, that the ego sort of co-ops it and it becomes us. Like when someone says, I'm carnivore or I'm a vegan. Right. No, you're a human being that has a meat suit 
that prefers a certain type of fuel. It's like if I went to the gas station and got unleaded gas, I wouldn't say, well, I'm on, I'm an unleaded. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd say, well, I prefer to put this kind of fuel in the car. You know, it's kind of where, where I've arrived. There's fuel that agrees with my body. There's fuel that agrees with my body less. And I just try to stay on the side of agreement. But I, it's such a trap, I think, you know, the personality attachment to it. I agree 100%. I mean, I think there's things that are much more profound to seek as a tribe, things like spiritual connection, right? I mean, a dietary philosophy shouldn't be the, the driver of your tribal dynamics. Again, finding people that have similar core values beyond the type of food you eat makes a lot more sense. Yeah, totally. And you're not going to fight about that. I could give two shits what my friends eat or don't eat, you know? I mean, I don't know how you guys go out to dinner. That might have been difficult before you figured it out, right? Because you want to go to the barbecue spot and you want to go to the... We smoothies. trade off. Yeah, you you know, trade so off. Some, some, some days I, 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 I have a more successful meal than maybe Matt does. And sometimes he has a more successful meal or a more enjoyable environment. But even in those environments... I like the experience. We were in a place the other night that suboptimal for my dietary component, but I had an amazing conversation with one of the guests and I wasn't distracted by eating. I was completely focused on the conversation and, and was enriched by that experience far more than any food could provide for me. And so I think the more that you can get out of those, you know, those, those are the the vegetarians or those are the you know the carnivorians or whatever that if you can get away from that kind of biblical tribal battle then you can start to see people as people and there's often elements that you can learn and matt with his ketogenic tendencies early on you know brought to light some key elements that I was simply not aware of and my life is beneficial. You know, I benefited from those integrations on my plant-based diet. And so I think you can always extract some gold from someone of a different camp and a different philosophy and a different way of doing things because, you know, you don't know everything and, and science is always changing and evolving and that's part of the human experience. Do you guys think that... Uh, one of the reasons people sometimes see such dramatic healing results at the beginning of kind of a very restrictive diet, like a vegan diet or carnivore diet, is just based on the fact that they're essentially on an elimination diet. That's that's a big part of it. Or, and or, they're patching deficiencies. So if a vegan, let's say they have certain deficiencies, goes on a ketogenic or carnivore diet, they're getting more amino acids. They're getting you know a whole new set of nutrients that they were probably missing. And then they feel amazing. And then after a few months, sometimes they develop new deficiencies. So a lot of people kind of bounce from diet to diet because at some point it just stops working. That's why there's a ha chapter that every diet works for a while. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right? been my experience. Yeah, yeah. so there's suboptimal parts of every diet. And there's optimal parts of every diet. No diet is singularly perfect on its own, especially within the exclusive box that's propagated on most media or, you know, because the depth and breadth of a conversation for an hour isn't going to identify the individual components. And I think maybe we can walk them through the nutritional pyramid of decisions and how those, that framework helps guide the individual it's okay to be a paleo person or a vegan or a carnivore, but what are the things that are going to allow you to sustain that? How do you optimize based on your goals and your genetics? And so like, for example, I'm predisposed for uh, poor cardiovascular, uh, too bad car poor cardiovascular genes, suboptimal on uh, lipa like lipase pathway. So I don't metabolize fats well. I have suboptimal genetics on blood sugar, and I don't get satiated very quickly. So I have a slow delay. So that means I have a tendency to overeat and that overeating is going to lead to probably cardiovascular problems with if I was 70 or 80. So I've crafted a diet that offsets those tendencies, understanding that within a plant-based diet that I've chosen. And Matt's done similar things in his life. 
What did you guys do in terms of the genetic testing? I'm curious about that. I recently did the latest version of the Viome test, and it, you know, sent me back all this uh, these data points, and it was pretty freaking accurate. I remember kind of just one takeaway was like, your gut is your weak spot, which has always been true. Which is probably why I really gravitated toward you guys because. So much of the shit you make has changed my digestion so dramatically, and we'll get into that. So thank you for making products that fixed me. But I, I'm unclear, like when people talk about the genetic component of finding a unique biocompatible way of eating for a person, how do they arrive at those genetics and how do we know that they're trustworthy other than just like what I did? It was kind of like, yeah, actually, that's pretty aligned with my subjective experience. Yeah, we're actually working with some of the top genetic experts to launch our own tests. So oh, cool. it's coming soon. But we're not stopping there. We've actually created an app. You can download it now. It's called the Ultimate Nutrition App, available on Google's, Google Play Store and, and Apple. And what we're going to do is integrate people's genetic nutrigenomic data along with the app and then do some customizations. So that's coming soon. So the app is out now. The Amazing. nutrigenomic integration it's going to take a few more months, but uh, that's our goal. But yeah, back to the pyramid of nutritional decisions. What we wanted to do was give people a framework to help them des- that help them design the perfect diet for them. You know, the me diet, the you diet, whatever you want to call it. So the base layer is spiritual and cultural considerations. And you know, we have friends that are Muslims. They go through Ramadan. I have friends that are. Orthodox Jews, they have a lot of rules. You know, there's a lot of people that choose to become vegan because of spiritual considerations. So for these people, what they might be doing is not perfect for their genetics, but who are we to judge them or tell them they're wrong or tell them they should be eating a different way if for them it's a spiritual path, right? Um, We're not here to tell them they're wrong. We're here to help them. Because the other side of it is, even though somebody might be doing a vegan diet and it's not optimal for their genetics, there's a lot of strategies and tactics that they can do to make it work. So we can get into that. So that's the first base layer. The second layer is psychology and emotions. So we have a whole chapter on psychology, a whole chapter on emotions. And just to you know, touch on the emotional part, a lot of people use food as drugs, right? We're both in the program. So I'm sure you've met a lot of people in the program that also have food issues. Of, I've eaten a lot of donuts in my day. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And food, yeah. food, I mean. A lot of instant Folgers coffee made with tap water. <laughs> chased with donuts, yes. Yeah, no, the serotonin dopamine response from a fatty sugary treat is at the same level as heroin. I mean, if you scan a brain, whether, you know, you go to sidecar in California. I, I had that experience. I took a su- couple sidecar donuts and I thought I was stoned out of my mind. It was really intense. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, again, there's that food, that drug-like response to food. So a lot of people, you know, stress eat, they're emotional eaters or they have food issues. And a lot of that, as you're well aware, is driven by trauma that's just unresolved. So we have a whole chapter devoted to you know, at least guiding people or recommending certain tools, whether it's, you know, feedback, EFT, and so on, that they can use to clear that. But on the psychological side, you know, Wade and I are very different. And, you know, Wade, maybe talk about how you're a contrarian rebel and how you've crafted, you know, very challenging, unique goals to motivate yourself. Yeah, I I get um, excited about specific strategic constraints. So for example, I decided that I would become a bodybuilder without exogenous hormones and on a plant-based diet to see if it could be done. Now, virtually every, that was 20 years ago, virtually everybody told me it was not possible. And so what I realized is, well, maybe they're right, but I'm not going to know that if I just take on that assumption. So let's run an experiment. Turned out all right. Two years after I made that choice of standing on stage at the Mr. Universe contest, that's when I discovered the problem of restrictive dieting without reverse dieting. 
So that was another strategy. I thought I went from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow and gained 42 pounds. And then, you know, from there, I learned about the gut biome and then went through that journey. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, how do I compete at a world championships on a raw food vegan diet? And I did that in 2007, four years after the integrations of that. And then from that point, I was like, man, this is really a socially restrictive. So although I was able to master that and on a highly constrained, so, you know, we went from bodybuilding, we went to vegetarianism, then we went to raw food, and then we want to, uh, you know, let's compete in an environment where I'm already handcuffed because of some of those choices. After that, I was like, okay, that's enough restriction for me, you know? And then later on, you know, I re-engage in that process again, you know, as a 50-year-old to, to, and, you know, try running a marathon and doing a bodybuilding kind of an op opposite. So setting a different goal that's really restrictive. And then within those constraints and many of the kind of beliefs that people project on it are true to a point. You know, yeah, is it harder to get amino acids on a vegetarian diet? Yes. Is it suboptimal for maybe blood sugar regulation? Yeah, probably. You know, do you have uh, insufficient amount of essential fatty acids? Yes. Okay. So let's take those constraints and let's optimize my diet based on those parameters. And that's where discovery happens under, you know, controlled constraints. And so I get excited about that. I can stay on something for years and accept maybe some of the suboptimal pieces so that I can make that breakthrough discovery. And I get really excited about that. If I don't have that, a bag of chips looks a lot more motivating than that. So, you know, so, so, so socialized wise, I get a lot of joy out of feasting. I love, you know, eating a whole array of foods that people would say that, you know, are evil. And, uh, and then I also enjoy highly restrictive fasting, 10 day water fast, you know, constrained diet stuff. So I'm a little bit more on the extreme side and that's my nature. And so I understand that about myself and though I apply myself within that framework. Uh, and then Matt, you're completely different. Yeah. First of all, I'm a questioner. So I need to understand all the scientific nuances, the mechanisms, how it, how it works. Once I, I do, then I'm motivated to do it. If I don't, I'm like, well, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. So that's one example. Some other examples are, I love novelty. You know, I love new things. So Wade's able to kind of go into a hyper-restrictive diet and he's an abstainer. So he's able to just not eat any sort of cheat meals or whatever. And that works well for him because if he goes off, then he can continue and overeat for days or weeks. For years. me, <laughs> years. <laughs> so yeah. for, for me, every week, I need some dietary freedom. So what I've done is I do a cyclical ketogenic diet. I've been doing that since I'm 16, 17. Of course, it's evolved and there's a lot of nuances, but I like one day a week where I can go eat a burger or go eat sushi go to a new restaurant. I'm a foodie. I love, you know, new food experiences. And I've been able to make that work. So again, it's just understanding yourself is, is critical. And there's, there's a lot of different nutritional, psychological elements that we have in that, in that chapter. So then we get to the third level. So that's just the foundational stuff, which mm -hmm. almost no one talks about, right? Then we get to goals and there's five epic goals. So there's weight loss, which there's essentially an entire weight loss book within the book. There's muscle building, which both Wade and I have been extremely successful adding 30, 40 pounds of lean body mass in our frames. Then there's athletic performance, cognitive performance, and then there's health, which really is health span, lifespan. So we have entire chapters devoted to all of these goals. And, you know, everybody should always have a goal. You know, goals create a dopamine loop. As soon as you have a goal, now, as you move towards it, as you take action or accomplish things that get you closer, you're getting that dopamine response. And I think it's critical to always, always have a goal because, you know, we've both been in times in our lives where we didn't have goals and kind of defaulted or drifted back towards, you know, a suboptimal life. So then, and I learned that as a trainer, I, I rarely lost a client. And I think the main reason was, as we would get closer to their goal, I would create another goal for them. Say, okay, we've almost accomplished a weight loss goal. Let's build lean muscle mass after that. 
So being able to even shift from one goal to another keeps people driven and motivated. I mean, we all need dopamine, again, healthy dopamine, to propel us to action. I I love that piece about the goal too, because I mean, you know, if you're into entrepreneurship and personal development, right? It's all about like writing down your goals. And I've kind of been aware of that, but uh, recently someone recommended to me, my office is right down there and I'll walk in there and I'm just like, I don't know what to do. I know I have a bunch of shit to do. I don't know what to do. Or I'll do the thing that is easy, low hanging fruit, not the big scary thing, you know, the eat the frog thing. And he said, here's what you do, man. Every morning you get up, get your, um, your post-it note, like the big whiteboard ones is right. Like write the three to five most critical things that day and put it right in front of your desk. And I started doing that. I'll be damned. I sit at my desk and I'm about to go on Twitter and waste my life and give myself dopamine hits of the negative nature, right? Of all the doom and gloom in the world, the doom scrolling addiction. And I'll look over at that thing. And because it's just because it's sitting there, I will actually do those three to five things that require a much higher um, cognitive commitment. Or maybe there's, you know, uh, an opportunity where I might face rejection because I haven't asked for someone or something like that. Those emails, I'm like, ah, awkward. I don't want to send this email. If that's what's on my list or working on my book, you guys know the challenges I'm sure now. Writing a massive book like that, the resistance that one can meet when you have like big goals. So that's something that's really, really important. I like how you apply that um, to the way that you eat because I know if I don't have any dietary goals, I'm just going to like cheat what I eat to the limit of starting to feel shitty and then scale it back. (laughs) What can I get away with? You know, I start getting on an ice cream kick and then I'm (laughs) like, oh, cool. I look like I'm three months pregnant. Fuck, what happened? Oh, I didn't, you know, I had no goals and no parameters other than just like try to eat Food that's not toxic. To well, me, there's basically. a great tactic, a way to maybe talk about alarms because that's yeah. part of the game plan. Yeah, so I'm right with you. you. Left to my own devices, I'd be 500 pounds. Really? I love, oh, yeah, I love eating. Um, and I love training. And I, 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 just, I like I'm an excessive, intense type of person. And so what I've discovered in my bodybuilding journey is set weight. So in bodybuilding, First and foremost, they're the original biohackers. They're manipulating over two genetic tendencies, the increase of storing fat and, you know, having a suboptimal amount of muscle. In other words, more muscle than you require. So those are very strong biases and they've developed all these strategies to successfully navigate. And virtually every bodybuilder or fitness competitor will enter on stage. The worst competitor is probably better than the average person would ever even consider getting to at any point. So they've, and they follow mostly if it fits your macros. I mean, that's one of the dietary strategies. But when you're going into that a bodybuilding contest, you're actually getting below an ideal healthy weight. You're in a performance diet. So there's a difference between looking good and actually being healthy. And in the bodybuilding world, what looks good or successful in that endeavor is generally not healthy. It's performance from a cosmetic perspective and that's it. So to come out of that, you want to, let's say, we'll use an arbitrary number. I'm I'm 185 pounds is maybe my optimal healthy weight. I'm going to compete at maybe 170, 172. And then I'm going to drift back up as high as 195. And when I hit the 195 zone, an alarm bell goes off that says, I'm now getting outside of my range of optimal health. And it's only a few weeks to pull back as opposed to left without that mental vigilance. Next thing you know, I'm 210, 215. And then I've developed a a pattern of behavior, which is suboptimal. So creating and crafting an environment of success so that you can be successful on your diet fit your social and psychological goals, fit your emotional stuff. Is There's a goal there to go for. These create directional points that allows mental vigilance. Say, am I moving towards my goal or away from my goal? And that reference point is really great because otherwise we're going to default to overeating because that's a survival mechanism that's built into the machine. Uh, we're going to reduce the amount of exercise we do because that's built into the machine of, of preserving energy because it was a problem. And those two defaults will take you out of dietary success, regardless of who you are, where you are, how old you are, genetically. Everybody has to understand that model. And if you don't, 
you're going to be in the 97% of people who start a diet and regress back. So if you're one of those people listening, this is the good news. We've decoded why that happened to you. It's natural. It's normal. It's an evolutionary bias. And we show you how to use the same evolution against itself to be successful. Wow. That's cool. You reminded me of uh, my recent favorite show uh, called Alone. It's one of these survivor shows. And the really the main point of, well, the main goal of each person is to make it the longest time, right? And so they're always fighting the calorie gain versus the calorie deficit. You can really, it made me think of that because it's like the body wants maximum calories, fats, sugar, et cetera, right? But it also doesn't want to expend calories. But that's, that's a really great way you frame that because I feel, I don't like working out. I'm just, I don't. I hate gyms. I can't stand working out. I do it because I don't want to fall apart and it makes me feel good, but I really don't enjoy it. So I'm a great example of someone who likes to eat dopamine inducing foods like pizza and ice cream. They make me feel like shit and then I feel guilty so I don't do it for a while and then I relapse. To get myself to exercise is very difficult because I don't have a goal. And also I have the inertia of the evolution as you described. Mm -hmm. I've never heard it stated that way. My body's going, no, definitely just sit around all day on your ass. Don't, don't waste any calories. Don't burn energy. Just keep adding energy, right? And then you have a recipe for, for ill health and being overweight and all the problems that come with that. It's a really, that's a really interesting way to look at it. It's like we're evolutionarily designed to be less than optimal. Yeah, speaking of genetics, let's go to the fourth tier of the pyramid, which is nutrigenomics. Wade shared a couple of his examples. And this is where you can, no matter what diet you're on, you can take it to the next level. So again, been ketogenic for over 30 years now. And I just found out relatively recently that I have bad genetics for saturated fats. And I've been eating a lot of ribeyes and a lot of fatty steaks. And my lipid profile isn't great the one thing I've struggled to optimize and now I I know why. So what I've done, I'm reducing my saturated fat intake. I'm eating leaner cuts, eating more seafood, and I'm increasing my monosaturated fat. So more olive oil, more macadamia nuts. So that's an example of a nuance that you can, again, optimize. Another one is selenium. I've got a deficiency in selenium because, and I've been eating a Brazil nut every day, sometimes two, it's not enough for me. Why? Because again, I have a genetic variant that causes me to struggle with selenium. So now I have to up my selenium intake, which long-term could have a massive impact on my health. So that's a, a critical part of the entire puzzle. And no matter what diet you're on, these nuances can definitely make a massive, massive impact. What about the, we talked earlier about, kind of about the emotional component, right? Underlying issues and trauma that cause someone to overeat or crave foods that don't serve them. What about the stress and full-on orthorexia or borderline orthorexia that comes along with being so controlling about your diet, right? I think many of us go through these phases where we start to get educated and listen to people like you guys and other people on the show and think, oh man, lectins are bad for you and gluten's bad for you and oh, the oxalates in the kale smoothie. Oops, you know, no wonder I have kidney stones, right? And then all of a sudden your road starts to grow narrow and it's it's like becomes a stressor, right? That limbic system fight or flight thing is activated because you're threatened by everything around you. I think many of us have a difficult time finding the balance of being relaxed about the way I'm we show, eat. I'm showing my sock, which is a Reese's sock. I know that. Because one, one of the things we're talking about in the book is that there's no evil foods. If you spend a week on Instagram and you get sucked into a nutritional algorithm, you're going to be terrified of going to the grocery store and buying food. Yep. We talk about that. Years ago, when I was a member of the raw food community, I remember going to an event and this person came up to me with kind of, and, and at that time I was considered like kind of a rock star because I was a raw food bodybuilder. And so they were wheeling me out as the adversary to everybody that was attacking them. And this, frankly, a very unhealthy waif-like character kind of came my way. And it was pretty obvious that this person was not well on any level. And they look at me with this kind of glazed look in their eye and they're like, what percentage of raw? 
are you? And I knew at that moment, if I didn't say 100% raw, that a lightning bolt was probably going to strike me or some group of people were going to come out and like throw walnuts at me or something. And I became aware of the cult dynamics. And then I thought through the bodybuilding world, which is its its own cult. And then I thought about the dietary stuff and the, the cult dynamics where people, even though they had dramatic evidence that what they were doing wasn't working and they would continue on that route because the control mechanisms, there was so much psychological, emotional juice that I'm controlling everything that they were unwilling to actually look at objective information. Now, of course, back then we didn't have the same amount of data. And I was always, I'm more of an intuitive side and Matt's always a data guy. And so we would battle on how I, you know, my observational stuff with myself. And he'd say, well, the data says this or the data says that. And, and we started to realize that, well, both things can be valid depending on how you're able to leverage that. And also you've got to expose your biases. We all have biases. I have biases. He has biases. You have biases. But we don't know what our bias is, even though maybe all our friends do. <laughs> so trying to address that in a, in a, having these structures that Matt's referring to allows you to kind of run that filter test. Am I just getting off on the restriction <laughs> and, and hurting myself? Or am I actually following something that has a data point or an intuitive awareness? Just go a little deeper. You know, there is a nutritional dichotomy, which on one side, there are no evil foods, right? The dose creates the effect. If I have a chocolate bar once a week, it's going to have zero impact on my long-term health. Or, you know, if I have Coke Zero, if you have a pizza once in a while, it, it's just irrelevant. And there's a lot of strategies you can do to mitigate if essentially all the negative effects, whether it's enzymes, for example. And we proved it in the lab that if you use Capex, you can break down seed oil. Really? So, so you can break down maldialdehyde. What? Into fatty acids. Now, if the seed oils have become a part of your cells, that's a whole different okay. story. But when you're eating them, you can break that's them down. That's one of the uh, the uh, enzyme fl uh, Correct. blends it's, that you guys it's make? A, it's a very rich lipase yeah. blend. Right? Yeah. It's designed to break down fats. So, you know, there, there's solutions for everything. But on the other side, we have a whole chapter, and it's actually one of the layers of the pyramid, for food sensitivities and allergies. Obviously, people are allergic to food. They avoid those completely because they can be very dangerous or deadly. And yes, there are some food sensitivities like nightshades, like lectins, like oxalates. But the thing that bothers us is it's way overblown. People use that to create fear because fear is a powerful marketing tool, gets attention. They write books about it as if everybody should be worried about eating almonds. All you got to do is soak them right? Dehydrate them. If you eat a kale salad once in a while, the oxalates are not going to kill you. Because again, the dose creates the effect. Okay, you're eating three pounds of kale a day every day. Then yeah, maybe over time you'll have some problems. Same thing with lectins, just soak the beans, right? Like these things are just overblown. And we're here to, again, invite the, the zealots and the fear mongers to drop that and adopt a more unified approach because that's really what we're all about. There's also another part of where you are in your journey. So oftentimes a person will be attracted to a diet because the restrictive nature of that philosophy addresses some of their physiological conditions. Once they overcome those physiological conditions, and gut biome is a great case, right now 12% of the emergency hospital visits are gastrointestinal related problems. Really? Yeah, it's crazy. So there's a lot of people with digestive issues because they've, they've been eating a vast array of foods that have been developed in the last hundred years that their body has no capability of managing. And they've accumulated over time and created an array of conditions that they now self-identify and get an identity around and have some sort of medication to mitigate because there's a disease condition, et cetera. Well, of course, going on a restrictive diet of some sort that eliminating the agents that are causing the problem is a great case. 
And then maybe they start adding some other elements like enzymes or probiotics to start shifting their biome or they you they go to a hormone optimization program or they start looking at a hair analysis or maybe they have suboptimal detoxification so they get into a detoxification routine because that's what's right for them. Now their body after maybe six months, a year, two years, they're dealing with a complete different capability. And now maybe they can start introducing foods that were previously causing problems. And so what we found is if you apply the strategies in this book over time, you expand your options, that you're not limited by a dietary paradigm, that you can have socially fun foods or culturally integrated foods, not have the fear, not feel like you're the, the, the weirdo at the social occasion or the family occasion. And the freedom that a person experiences in that component. And Matt and I have gone through that entire journey of the restriction, the zealotry, the my way or the highway, the you're bad, you're evil, that sort of stuff. And we've come out of that and we've laid down the tracks for people to identify where they are in that journey, what they can implement in that journey so that they have the ultimate level of freedom within any diet or within any conversation with someone of a different quote-unquote dietary tribe. And that's exciting. And that's what we want everyone to experience. We shouldn't be arguing about diet. We should be sharing information with the same goal in mind. And that is that people can live healthy, they can be strong, and they can live long. And if, you can, if we come together on those values, then the rest of the things are just details. I like that, the moderate approach. I think that a lot of the time people are probably reacting to different foods, going to the lectins and oxalates and seed oils and all the things. I think that people are probably reacting to the food because they have such a strong belief that they're going to react to it, right? Because mm -hmm. there's been times, yeah. well, you guys make that uh, gluten guardian, yeah. by the way, highly, highly recommend. And I forgot to say the show notes. It's lukestory.com slash diet wars. So anything we talk about will be in the show description there, including links to the book and all those things. But your Gluten Guardian product from Bioptimizers, that's like my secret weapon when I'm going off the rails and I have to have pizza. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll take like six of them before, a few <laughs> afterward, and I'm much better. I mean, for real, it works. I don't know what you did there, but it's very helpful. But then there are times where I don't have my gluten guardian and my wife loves pizza. And so if she has it, I, I don't have the discipline to not eat it some of the time. Sometimes I'm strong, sometimes I'm not. But it's so weird. Sometimes I eat it and I'm totally fine. And I'm just like, was it because I believed I was going to be totally fine and I just let myself have that freedom and kind of relaxed about it and wasn't as orthorexic? Well, I, I for a while, I thought A1 protein was evil. So again, there's you know two primary dairy proteins, A1, yeah. A2, because I would have A1 dairy and have an inflammatory response. So I thought it was evil. What I had was a leaky gut. And again, the A1 protein would you know go through my intestinal tract, go into my bloodstream, cause an inflammatory response. We created a product which, as far as sealing the gut, is incredible called Microbiome Breakthrough. I don't know if you've tried it. It's No, what's up? It's Look a it biofilm up, man. builder. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, cool. So yeah, it's a powder. You can drink it. We have a vegetarian version and a carnivore version or a chocolate version. But when I started using that, I was able to eat dairy A1 protein and have no issues. So a lot of times, there's a lot of inflammatory responses that are created due to leaky gut. So that might be the situation. Yeah. Eat, you know, pizza, well, it's which like has to cheese. your point, you know, of, as you start to heal and you become more resilient, you do have a little more leeway aside from just like letting down your mental stress of the control freak energy. But also I think you just do become more resilient. I've definitely noticed that over time, there would have been foods I was much more reactive to and they don't seem to bother me anymore. I think it has a lot to do with just focusing a lot on gut healing. And you guys have been a huge help in, that process. I have like a massive, uh, you know, one of those like uh, airtight jars of the um, the masszymes. These guys right here. Like I literally don't ever eat without a handful of these. I probably take more than you need, but by the by the way, we've just released the 5.0. Oh, really? it's thirty percent stronger than the, the that one you you've got right there. And we just did a bunch of experiments. It turns protein to a pool of amino acids and peptides in thirty minutes. Like it's. 
we tested other <laughs> enzymes. There's, there's nothing like it. Well, you know, that's funny because sometimes I'll put the mass enzymes, I'll just empty the capsules in my smoothie. And then I let, if I let it sit there too long and I come back, it's like crazy acidic because it's just, it melted it all into pure amino acids or something. So I'm like, I have to have a sweet spot of the timing because it starts to pre-digest the proteins and fats so, so fast that it like doesn't taste as pleasant. And that's another discovery out of the bodybuilding world. So almost all of the top bodybuilders run into the same problem because protein consumption is an essential component in order for them to build sufficient amount of super physiological levels of amino acids. And they also have to be in a strategic calorie surplus for years and years. And this puts an extreme level of digestive distress. And what a lot of people don't know is many of the top professionals in the bodybuilding world end their careers because of dietary distress. The eating is so intense. You know, especially you get these guys 250, 260, 300 pounds and the amount of food they need to consume to sustain that level of muscle and recover from their workouts. It's a kind of a secret that that is now emerging amongst uh, the top athletes in the bodybuilding world is to use our masszymes, p 3 and hydrochloric acid. That combo is the ultimate digestive stack so that they convert the protein because undigested proteins circling the blood is what causes a lot of the conditions or dis, dis ease or discomfort that people experience because the body sees these undigested proteins as some sort of invasion and they start attacking it. And and so the top athletes in that world are now leveraging our products. And, and you know, I got into that from for the from a similar perspective. Only I was trying to optimize for not enough amino acids. Like you know, on a plant based diet, it's harder to get enough protein, especially twenty years ago. And there's no protein powders for plant based people. And so I had to optimize only eating eighty five grams of protein, where my competitors are eating two hundred fifty, three hundred grams. So I was able to get more amino acids with less protein, and then that's now caught fire in that industry, which is... So the trifecta uh, is the masszymes, hydrochloric H acid, ACL. and p 3 o And so a couple quick tests that people can test. If you feel bloated and digestive discomfort, you can take uh, a couple tablespoons of lemon juice after uh, a meal. And if you feel some of that bloating go away, you're probably deficient in enzymes. Or for hydrochloric acid, and pretty much everybody after 35 is low on hydrochloric acid. So what you can do on that is you take a four ounce glass of water with a quarter teaspoon to a half teaspoon of baking soda, stir it all up and then drink it down on an empty stomach. If you burp within five minutes, you have sufficient hydrochloric acid levels. If you don't, you probably don't. And then choosing the right probiotics. So P3OM is kind of like, there was what, six different tests that they do at the, the microbiology lab and it outperforms virtually everything on those key aspects of a protein digesting bacteria, which is very unusual in the bacteria strains. Well, I have a story for you guys about the P3OM, mm -hmm. this stuff right here for those watching. Uh, I remember one of you, when we did our last interview, said that um, in, in your research of developing that, that it had shown to very quickly eliminate um, food poisoning. And was that you that said that? Yeah, yeah, we it kills E. coli. That's a pretty bold claim. Uh -huh. So I always take it with me when I travel. And, and I give it to my wife anytime. She's like, oh, my stomach's gurgly. I'm like, take a few of those. Mm -hmm. I just got back from Indiana. She's still there. And I don't know, I went to the health food store. I was eating kind of what I eat here. I don't, know, I don't know if I eat something or what happened. But I had this really weird experience. I was also, I might have been shedded upon. That's another <laughs> possibility. But uh, some people understand that and some won't. Uh, anyway, we get back to the hotel. It's like 11 at night. And I start getting like all these pains in my joint. Like my knuckles started hurting and my knees. And then I got all feverish where I was like hot to the touch, but I was freezing. And I, it was like I had the flu and it came on within like 20 minutes and I couldn't sleep. And it was like, holy shit, I just got an insta flu. And I remembered that I had the P3OM. I thought, well, maybe if I have, if it was food poisoning or something, I took, so I took a handful of those and, um, and fell asleep and woke up a couple hours later in the middle of the night and it was totally gone. So I don't, I don't know if it was that, but I have had many experiences where I've ate something off 
Um, cause I don't really look at dates on stuff, you know, I don't know if it's a guy thing. My wife, like every time. <laughs> yeah, she I think it is. Dates, I'm like, who cares? It's close enough. She's like, no, it expired, you know, but sometimes I'll, you know, I'll get what I think is food poisoning and this shit gets rid of it. It's crazy. I will not travel without it, especially to, you know, different countries that have different levels of sanitation and whatnot, eating street food and God knows what. Yeah, just just to wrap up on the gut biome, which yeah, we've yeah. been talking about, which is one of the layers of the pyramid. Your gut biome is extremely dynamic. It's literally morphing with every meal. Probiotics have about a 48-hour lifespan. So let's say you fast for three days. A lot of your colonies have died or they've dried up. They can reanimate once they get refed. So they kind of go into a dormant state a lot of times, but a lot of them die. So even leaky gut is a very dynamic thing, meaning that right now your gut might be sealed, but maybe you eat the wrong foods or you fast for a while and now you've got leaky gut. And we've done well over a thousand experiments in our lab. We have 20 full-time scientists in our head of our lab, Monia. She has a PhD in bacteria and probiotics. We've done extensive testing, not just with our products, but we tested virtually every probiotic. And almost none of them create biofilm. So biofilm is what you want to seal your, seal your gut, a healthy biofilm. So that's what seals. So there's very few probiotics that colonize and again, create that healthy biofilm. And microbiome breakthrough is phenomenal for that. And I've been doing a lot of fasting this year, a lot of five-day fasts. And before, I would start eating and I would do all the classic recommendations, eat fruit, et cetera, and have some turbulence in the bathroom for a day or two. With microbiome breakthrough, zero every single time. Really? Every single time. And the other day, was it a fasting thing for whatever reason? I had a little bit of uh, diarrhea. And again, I just drank one, sh one drink and it was done. So now I feel like we've got the solution for diarrhea as well, which is a new thing. So, Well, I've used the P3OM for that quite successfully mm -hmm. too. You know, whether it was a pathogen or whatever it was. But anytime that I'm like gurgly and feeling weird, that fixes it. Yeah. So again, we've, we've tested both of them and P3OM is phenomenal for killing gram-negative bacteria. And then the, P3, the microbiome breakthrough is phenomenal for killing what's called gram-positive bacteria, which are awesome. harder to kill. Awesome. So they kind of kill different sets. And, and you were saying that you just take these with food as like part of a digestion protocol? Yes. Yeah. Well, just a QA data, but yeah, it's yeah. one of only two probiotics we've tested that are proteolytic. So they actually act like mass zymes. Oh, yeah. Okay. And undigested proteins are the primary cause of dietary inflammation or, you know, rancid fats would probably be the next one on the list. And getting your gut optimized is probably the biggest factor in opening up your dietary options. Now, of course, there are genetic components that you must be mindful of in the ultimate expression of that. But considering how many people have digestive problems, it's like, what, one in three Americans on any given day is having digest digestive distress. 25% of those are on permanent prescription medications. How many people are taking over-the-counters? So we feel that when we started to learn, we were classic nutritionists that just assumed, you know, when we started out in our university training was, hey, put food in and it's automatically magically converted into energy units or building blocks and the rest is eliminated. And there was, there was no application, even at a lot of the university levels and high levels to understand that, well, the state of your digestive system is going to determine how much energy you get from your food or how much building blocks you have. And that tends to degrade over time in this world. We are in a highly technologically advanced world. We have a vast array of foods that are great for us, foods that aren't so great for us, and foods that are probably in, you know, take with caution zone. And so your, your digestive capacity is going to determine how much damage that those inflammatory foods or how robust your dietary choice can be. And like I said, we're two guys with what most people would consider complete dietary different, like complete dietary philosophies on the surface. But because we understand the nuances, there's actually no issues between our dietary strategies at all. And nobody's talking about this stuff. 
And so we decided, let's put it all in a book. Let's people pick what they want to do. But, so they understand where to go, what to do, what questions to ask, how they leverage the right professionals or tests. It's all in there. You don't have to read the whole book. You can just read what's right for you right now. I noticed that in, in cruising through it, it's not like a book you have to read start to finish, thankfully, because it's massive. <laughs> it really is a Bible. Yeah, as if it choose your adventure, build yeah, your I adventure. I just started thumbing through it and I was like, oh yeah, I read this paragraph and kind of skip around. And and uh, and it's, I think, designed in a way that makes that easy to do. Uh, I got a question for you guys. So for a long, long time, probably because I had a gluten sensitivity and ignored it or was unaware of it, I had heartburn for years. Part of the reasons why my old teeth rotted out was because I was always burping up acid and breathing up like acidic, um, you know, uh, exhaust. So long time ago, I think before I met you guys, someone recommended I get on HCL, and I was like, "But I, ha but I'm burping up acid. Why would I take more acid?" And, oh, you don't, you know, it's because you don't have enough acid. So I got on HCL, and then when I met you guys, got on your HCL, and I didn't really do anything different except start to take hydrochloric acid with my meals and my heartburn went away and really never came back. And so then I just kind of like, I was like, I guess I don't need to take HCL anymore. So I stopped. I have some of your guys in my cabinet and I see it and I'm like, oh, I don't think I need it. So is, is my experience unique or universal with, with the heartburn issue, with the no, indigestion? I've, I've had some good friends go through that as well, where they were having some extreme heartburn situations and took HCL and didn't need it afterwards. Now we we still recommend usually taking like one capsule with mass signs with P3OM because we find it just synergizes. We're all about synergy and maximum effectiveness. But Wade, talk about why is it that not enough acid actually creates that acid reflux? Yeah. So what happens is in your and we break this down the five stages of digestion basically you release hydrochloric acid about 30 to 60 minutes after you consume food. And that has two functions. One, it disinfects the food from any bugs, parasites, bacteria, viruses, whatever. It's supposed to kill whatever could be with the food. And the other thing is it starts to change the pH, which activates some enzymes and deactivates other enzymes during that process. And we're the only species that eats food in a cooked state. And that destroys the enzyme. So often we have suboptimal enzymes at the food that we're consuming and therefore can't break it down very well. The second thing is, if we have insufficient levels of hydrochloric acid, then the food starts to ferment, creates a gas, pops the esophageal sphincter up, and whatever acid food mixture comes up, it starts to splash into the esophagus. People get heartburn or acid reflux. And the doctor says, oh, or the television commercial with the pink you know, the pink liquid, oh, we're just going to coat that acid. Now, now you're going to create a bigger problem down the road because now you're creating a suboptimal place for the killing of these um, inflammatory agents like bacteria. So H. pylori can proliferate and that is going to also contribute to hydrochloric acid uh, problems. So you don't, you know, and so when people take HCL for an extended period of time, oftentimes it's sufficient enough to starve out and kill off the H. pylori. And then once that's regulated, their body now has sufficient hydrochloric acid levels. So some people will find they'll, they'll, they'll take it for a couple of months or three months or six months. And of course, there's the genetic component again. So some people are going to be able to resolve that issue in a very short period of time. Some people may be predisposed. There's other uh, physiological conditions that can happen with a high amount of weight. You can be pushing up the stomach that can pop that up as well. So there's a variety of physiological conditions that can contribute. But if they're applying the principles in this over time, you're going to eliminate probably a, a large portion of those and can get yourself back. And these just become tools that you use. Like you said, I'm in a digestive stress situation. I've eaten the wrong foods. I'm in the wrong environment. I'm in a suboptimal place. How do I mitigate myself and use intelligence and technology to bring myself into homeostasis and move on with my day? And again, it's going back to, we're here to expand your options as opposed to restrict them. That's a great segue into, let's, let's wrap up the pyramid. We've got two more le levels. Okay. Supplements. And supplements should always be contextualized, personalized, based on your goals, your genetics, and really your blood work you know, your biomarkers. A lot of people 
you know, take supplements that they might not need. For example, my vitamin D levels, because I, I hyper-optimize the absorption so much that my vitamin D levels were off the charts. So like right now, I'm not taking any vitamin D. I'm trying to get them below 100. I was up to 150, which is high. Like 50 How do you optimize is range. your absorption? You take it with a lot of good fats. Oh, okay. Yeah, and we're, we're working on some some powerful blends and products. Cool. So Yeah. I, it, I want to hold that thought. Sure. But the interesting thing I learned about vitamin D recently is that based on genetics, that our absorption can be mm -hmm. so dramatically different. Um, I think that at some point I had tested and my vitamin D came back low. And I'm like, what? I'm in the sun. I'm in, I live in Texas. I'm out in the sun naked multiple times a day. Like, I don't, I don't know people that get any more sun than I do unless they live in Brazil or something, you know? And I'm like, how is that possible? And I'm, I must have a snip or something, right? That I don't, I don't absorb the vitamin D that's being produced. Well, take the whole aspect of melanin production, which determines our skin tone. It blows me away that people are arguing about the amount of melanin in this whole race thing. It's crazy. I know. But someone with Northern genetics, like I have a fair skin, very, very thin hair. I don't have that same components that if I was born in you know the West Indies or something, I can, I can manufacture enough vitamin D in 15 minutes that my girlfriend, who's Brazilian, she would need six to eight hours in the sun to get the same amount of vitamin D production that I have. So if you have darker skin and you're in a Northern climate, you need to be much more mindful. And the evidence suggests that, you know, bone density and vitamin D related issues and deficiencies because the body has been adapted to a high sun environment. Similarly, if I'm fair skin and I like to be in a sunny climate, so I need to be mindful and watching out for, you know, skin melanoma. Right, so I don't have the the best skin genetics, and I need to be conscientious of how I take care of my skin, or hydrate, or protect my skin in those environments. So I love being in the sun. It's not my genetic place that I'm supposed to be, but I enjoy it, and so I just, you know, take those lessons with a grain of salt. And I think that's what everybody needs to do. And humans have been successful uh, more than any other species as far as where they can live because we use intelligence in order to optimize for suboptimal environments. And that is the whole evolution of technology comes from that aspect. Awesome. All right, back back to your point, your uh, level two of the pyramid. I think you were- Well, we're on. at level eight, actually. We're at the top. We're, 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 we're going the top, from, the, right? from the foundation to the, the yeah. pinnacle. Okay, yes. Got and it. again, like if your goal is muscle building and taking anabolic activators makes a lot of sense. If you're in a weight loss journey and you're in a calorie dep dep deprivation cycle, then you might have certain nutrient deficiencies. So you, you need to be mindful of, again, what your goals are and then ideally get blood work. You know, look at your biomarkers, see where you're off, see where you're deficient. I just had a hair analysis and I need more selenium, I need more potassium. So I'm adjusting my supplement cycle based on the data. And again, there's a, we have a whole chapter devoted to that, which we go through like all the tests people should do, how frequently they should do them. Oh, that's high value because that's really difficult to figure out. There's and it so can be many... expensive. So Dude, you want the right crazy. test at the yeah. right time. So, you know, everybody has or most people have some sort of limited budget that they're applying to their health program. And so what we want to give you is the tools to, to strategically deploy your valuable dollars um, to the right test, to the right expert relative to your diet so that you're making the right decisions. And then Oh, based on this information, I'm going to benefit from this particular supplement. That doesn't mean that that supplement's good for everybody. And we're so committed to that philosophy that all of our products have a 365-day money-back guarantee <laughs> because maybe they didn't yeah. have the book beforehand, bought our supplement, yeah. it wasn't right for their diet. They bought uh, Vegzymes when they should have been having and they should have been having Capex. I was wondering about that return policy because people that listen to the show, I'm always plugging the Magnesium Breakthrough. You guys are one of the loyal sponsors that's been with us for a long time. And sometimes in the copy that I'm reading, it'll say, money back guarantee, 365 days a year. And I'm like, how do they stay in business? That's a long time. Someone could just have that shit sitting in their pantry and then be like, oh, I want my 30 bucks back or whatever. Well, people are really generally appreciative when you solve their problem. And so there's four promises that come with every product that we serve. You know, the, 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 the product does what it says it does, that they know how to take it and, and use it for its maximum benefit, that the product arrives in a reasonable amount of time. 
And if any of those things didn't occur in that process, then there's a promise that we're going to resolve that. So we have live agents to handle your questions. Those, those questions, if they have an answer, they get filtered directly to myself or to Matt. And we've built up massive databases to solve pretty much every situation that can come in. If there's something that happened in delivery or something they didn't understand, we have uh, ways we've addressed that with the supplemental guide and how to take things. If you're a scientific side, we got the research journal. If you're in a dietary philosophy, we got the cookbooks that come with this. So this has been an internal policy for literally uh, years and years. But now we've been able to take that and condense it into actionable, strategic tactics that people can deploy. And if something they took from us didn't work, well, of course I want them to give their, give their money back. I don't deserve that. I want them to redeploy that to maybe someone else in the industry that can solve their problem. And we have, I think, the lowest refund rate of any nutritional supplement company I have ever seen. We've got Six Sigma customer service. You talk to real people, not machines, not robots, not AI. And uh, we I love, love that. We love those questions. Thank because you. Because sometimes your, your customers can tell you the thing that you never thought of. And many of the unique products that we've developed is because we found from our customers that there was, a, there was something that wasn't being solved by the marketplace. And our team said, hey, let's deploy the resources to solve that problem. And we've been doing that for a long time. And that's why we have labs and testing facilities and PhDs and all kinds of... Matt's a, a mad scientist experimenter and he has a whole team of people who just run experiments all the time based on, the, based on what the market is telling us and what they need solved. Yeah. Well, now that I think about it, thinking about that return policy, because um, I work with, I don't know, 130 brands or something, right? Just anything that I take that I think is useful for me, I share it with people uh, on the show and on social media and stuff. And every once in a while, it doesn't happen often, think, thankfully, but every once in a while, someone will email me because they went through a link on my website and they're like, what the hell is going on with this company? You know, They won't get back to me and I want my thing. There's a problem with customer service or fulfillment or something. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry that's happening. And then I try to send it to someone higher up in the company. Rare, but it does happen, especially with newer companies that are kind of scrappy and just startups and stuff like that in the in the supplement space. But as you were describing uh, your your process and kind of the system you guys have, I can't remember ever one time anyone bitching about by optimizers. So congratulations, thank you for having integrity and taking care of your your customers. Because I, as a consumer, I can't stand that shit when you like try to email and they never get back to you or you're on some bot chat. It is excruciating. I'm like, give me a human being that can help me. I gave you my money. We're yes. in a contract now. Yes. Right? The contract doesn't end when you send me my shit and you have my money because I still have your product and I'm having a problem with it. Right. Therefore, there's a breach in integrity every once in a while. I mean, thankfully not often, but when it is, it personally pisses me off big time especially if it's a, a brand I'm telling people about, then it's like my reputation is on the line because Luke is who I found out about this from. And now, you know, I can't get my refund or the shipping got screwed up or whatever it is. So I appreciate that. Uh, you were talking about targeted supplementation, yeah. Matt, and the critical role that, you know, lab work can play in that. So we might spend a little money on lab work, but then we're going to get rid of the 25 supplements we're spending money on every month that we don't actually need. They might be great for other people in their unique circumstances, but we don't need that vitamin D because guess what? We just tested and our levels are good. So maybe wrap that particular uh, layer of the pyramid up. No, I think that's that's the main point. Um, I, there's a few supplements you can take all the time. I think mass times is one of them. I mean, you know. Every day, baby. Every day, every meal. <laughs> Um, Unless you want to fart a lot, <laughs> take your mat. I mean, at least for me, I, I need the enzymes. But even, you know, very popular supplements like vitamins and in even certain minerals, you need to be mindful of your, your blood levels. So I think most people, especially are deficient in minerals, magnesium, potassium. Most people are over consuming calcium because there's so many foods that are fortified with calcium. So there's definitely a lot of unoptimized mineral profiles out there and the blood work reveals it or the hair analysis. Yeah. Minerals, man, can get really wacky. If you hear, oh, like for a while I um, discovered copper as this, you know, kind of really 
widespread deficiency and many people are unaware of it. And there's a lot of misinformation about copper toxicity that kind of got into the thought sphere of wellness. So everyone got scared of copper, but I started taking it and then learned like, yeah, if you take a shitload of copper, it'll dysregulate your zinc. Like the minerals especially are really tricky without testing. They need like a 10 to 150. Yeah. We have a whole chapter devoted to micronutrients. Oh, cool. So, cause again, yeah, calories matter, macronutrients matter and micronutrients matter. And I think a lot of people in the nutrition world get you know, hyper-focused or myopic with one of those levels. So we're trying to present the, the whole picture. Awesome. Hey, before I forget, you spoke about your, you know, uptake of selenium. And so you're eating more Brazil nuts. I interviewed a guy named Mark Squibb from uh, Live O2. They make this contrast oxygen hypoxic training machine. Great technology, really interesting guy. And um, I don't think they sold it at the time, but someone in his team was like, oh, we make this kind of, you know, VI just for our VIP friends, this selenium that is, it's an oil extract of from brazil nuts and it's like two drops or however many micrograms like super super high dose with a very tiny amount and that should i have some and i think they sell it now on the live o2 site and it's by far the best selenium that i've ever found because it's it's just literally like a concentrate of the oil i'll check that out yeah, afterwards but cool. yeah let's let's wrap up the pyramid yeah 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 the last layer which i think when we talk about something that's sustainable for life is lifestyle. Now, here's the process we're recommending. One is you know, create your goal, you know, reach what we call final form. Final form means you've got the level of lean muscle mass that you want and need. Again, you don't need to look like a bodybuilder, but most people from a health perspective would benefit greatly from adding an extra 10 or 20 pounds of lean body mass, right? We know it absorbs glucose. We know as we get older, it has a massive influence on our longevity. So again, people need a certain amount of lean muscle mass to be optimized. Then there's your body fat. Again, everybody, we're, again, we're not advocating everybody gets ripped and shredded and puts on a bikini or <laughs> spandex and goes on stage. <laughs> get to a, a low, healthy, reasonable body fat level, and then you just want to maintain that. So the goal is, again, build your lean body mass lower your body fat. And then from there, that's what we call final form. The great news is it's, you know, mentally about 80% easier to maintain something than it is to achieve it. And even physiologically, it only takes about a third. Here's some encouraging news for you, somebody who doesn't like to work out. It only takes about a third of the weight resistance volume to maintain lean body mass than it takes to build it. So once oh, you built wow. it, like That's with three 20, 30 minute full body weight lifting workouts, you can maintain your lean body mass. But we talk about how kind of the lifestyle piece of the pyramid. Yeah, lifestyle is deciding where you want to go at, at a given period of your life. And your lifestyle is going to vary through the different stages of life. So, you know, we have aesthetics, performance, and health as the three kind of attractor fields into the industry. You know, you want to look better for aesthetics and then you become, you got a family or a career and you're literally trying to just optimize for performance because you got kids or a busy schedule. So maybe your dietary strategy and your exercise strategy is going to change. But ultimately, people end up in the bottom half of the period or the foundational aspect, which is health. How do I maintain my health over the duration of my life, because that's going to determine your bio span. In other words, your healthy aging profile. So can we extend your lifespan? I believe that we can, but we certainly know that we can optimize the life that you have if you practice these principles. So when you look at the stages of your life is, can I sustain this in this phase of my life? And making those decisions because we're not just our diet. We're not, we're a dynamic person with a, a dynamic amount of responsibilities in our lives to our family, to the people who we're cohabitating with or in relationship with, to the performance of our duties in life, uh, or maybe as a, a senior who wants to be vibrant and attentive to grandchildren. Peter Atia does a great job in his recent book about talking about that last 10 to 15 years when he draws the charts between you know, your kids and then your grandkids. And that five to 10 years, 
being in a great space as you age, the impact that can happen on that second generation or maybe even your great grandkids could be significant. And so there's 10,000 generations before us that successfully navigated all of the wars and famine and bugs and infections and every situation you can imagine. Every single person is the product of 10,000 generations of success. So the decisions that you make today in the lifestyle that you choose can have implications for 10,000 generations to come. And for me, that's a motivating reason for me to continue to dive into putting my whole life into this so that we can share the nuances for people that only have a little bit of time and a little bit of effort or a little bit of resources because they've got all these other commitments. So that's what the book's about, about finding the right lifestyle for you right now, finding the right diet for you right now, and then optimizing wherever you are on that scale. So whether you're an elite athlete, you know, a super centurion, you know, one of my friends, she's 105 years old, lives really? in our neighborhood. Yeah, it's amazing. Cool. You know, and so oh, when you're around gosh. someone like that, you also realize there's a huge social component to living your best life. And we don't want to forget that in a diet. We don't want to forget that as we enjoy the tribe that we fall under as a dietary person and to really embrace the true value of mastering your diet is that your lifestyle expands with choices, reduces friction, reduces the anxiety, helps you live your best life with all the best benefits to keep you out of dire situations of medications and surgeries and early aging. It seems to me that's a win for everybody. And we put it all together in this book so people can enjoy it. Well, you're speaking my language with the lifestyle. It's yeah. no accident that this podcast is called The Lifestylist, right? right? It's about meeting cats like you, getting bits of data, information, putting that together in a composite set of habits and choices that become your life, you know? And I know probably a certain number of people that listen to this show that are like, oh my God, it sounds like so much work. Dude, to be happy and healthy, I mean, I'd say spiritually, yeah, it's a lot of work to get your head together uh, in that realm. There's a lot of sacrifice in, in the surrender, as you guys know, being spiritual aspirants. But in terms of like building a healthy lifestyle, I feel like my lifestyle is totally normal and easy and there's time for me to do. I mean, I don't have kids yet, which is part of it. All my friends with kids are like, just wait, probably true. But you know, my meditation time, took a sauna this morning, jumped in the ice bath, made my smoothies, took some Newtopia nootropics. Apex, by the way, is my favorite of that. For general, you know, hanging out purposes, the, um, what's the ultimate focus though? that shit is incredible for focus, just as a side note. But I have my routines, right? And it's like, if you were just an average person and you came in and followed me around all day with a video camera, you'd be like, this guy's insane. Like, who has time to do all this shit? But it's, the time is created by the time I'm not spending doing other things that maybe I would have done years ago or that someone else, I'm not sitting around watching TV for four hours a night or whatever. Nothing wrong with watching TV. I watch my alone show, you know, and some good binges, but it's like, we don't, it's never difficult to find time to take a shower and brush your teeth and, and use the bathroom in the morning, right? It's just like, that's your morning routine. Well, I think with lifestyle, you can also just incrementally over time, add things that assist you in your vitality and well-being, And then they just become integrated into your day-to-day -day life. And it's not like this extra thing you have to do. Even like working out, I mean, I always joke that, oh, I hate working out. I still do it. It's just, it's part of my routine. It's just not something I'm like, yay, I'm going to go hit the X3 bar and then do a bunch of pull-ups or whatever I'm doing. You know, it's kind of like, oh, I got to really kick myself in the ass to do it. But it is still part of my, I don't know, three times a week, my routine. And if I don't do it, I feel like mm, I'm not meeting that goal. You know, my goal is to just maintain some level of fitness so I don't fall apart. Just to wrap up on the lifestyle, food is one of life's great joys. You know, going to a new place. I went to Europe for three weeks with my parents and my brothers and my wife and baby girl. And it's not like restricting myself and not eating, again, incredible Italian food and Spanish food and French food was on the menu. However, I was still able to lose weight. So one of the things I'm the most proud of in the last two years 
is every trip I've taken to my parents' place or on vacation, I've come back at the same body weight or or less. <laughs> wow. And I've been eating whatever I wanted, however, not however much I wanted. And that's a big, okay. big distinction. And there's a whole chapter around all the tactics that you can do around the holidays. And you know, one of the most powerful strategies is to look at your calories from a weekly perspective instead of a daily perspective. So if you look at calories as a budget, you know, let's say your calorie allotment is 3,000 a day. So you've got 21,000 calories a week that you can eat without gaining body fat. So if one day you're at 6,000 calories, because again, you ate a pizza, which a 12-inch pizza can be about 3,000 calories. Probably. Really? Yeah. Oh my it's God. It's probably the easiest food to overconsume calories as a pizza, I would say. Oh, it's so good. That so is, good. it's so good, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, the point is that you can either fast earlier in the day, you can fast tomorrow, you could increase exercise, you can try to build lean muscle mass. There's a lot of tactics you can do to mitigate the overconsumption of calories when you're another. Because one of Wade and I's favorite things is once in a while, just go and feast. Eat four or 5,000 calories in one meal. I mean, yeah. it just satisfies some psychological aspect. Our team dinners are outrageous. And we encourage outrageous and a lot of people are shocked. I can't believe you guys are eating all this food and this variety and this mass. But what they don't realize is, you know, later in the week, I might have deployed a 48-hour fast. And, and that just becomes regimented inside of, the, inside of that structure. So often people will get a snapshot and don't get the whole picture. But when you're armed with these tactics, you can go into any situation and know, I have the cap capability to navigate it. I don't have to compromise my social, cultural commitments. I can serve my psychology and my emotions. I can have the ultimate lifestyle, feel great, feel confident, and blow my friends' minds because I'm able to do things that seem counterintuitive. Matt and I, if we didn't do this, we'd probably be either dead or 300 pounds with a variety of conditions and on a bunch of medications. So we don't have the best genetics. We're not genetic freaks. We're not predisposed to being healthy or being vital or any of those issues. We got into this because our passion project was, is we knew that we struggled with these things. This wasn't easy stuff for us. And we've dedicated our lives to solving these riddles. And we want to share them in one concise book. Like I said, it was 20 years of arguments, 30, 60 plus collective years of, of uh, our own investigations and experimentations and three years to compress all of that into actionable dynamics that we're going to just go in, see the issue that they're dealing with, dive right into it, list their tactics, figure out what they need to do, and then move on. And then, of course, there's going to be some people that want to get into the 875 scientific journals, which comes with it. They want to get into the nutritional supplement guide, which we expand to all different kinds of companies, not a, just for us or anything like that. Or they want to dive into... You know, some new creations. They want to have raw food desserts as an experiment from their carnivore diet. Why not? Could happen. Yeah, so not only did we create the book, we created what's called the Ultimate Nutrition System. I was going to ask you about that. So that includes that. the book, and we spent a week in the Hollywood Hills. We filmed the entire book. So we spent an entire week with a professional film crew, spent a lot of money, filmed the entire thing. The editing is incredible, so it's visually interesting. And we guide you through the entire book. So if you don't like reading, you can watch that. You also get, as Wade mentioned, there's 875 references. We created a summary of every scientific reference that's in the book. We put that in a PDF. You get that. You get three different cookbooks, a paleo cookbook, a plant-based cookbook, and a carnivore cookbook. So again, we cover every diet style. You get From Sick to Superhuman, which is our other book. and the original draft of this book was about twice this size, which I know sounds crazy, but it was. Damn. And we took 215 pages out of it and created a supplement book. And it's not just our supplements. It's every category of supplement categorized by goals. You get that as well. So you get all of that in the ultimate nutrition system.com. Dude, ahead, badass. All right. I'm glad you mentioned that because that was in my notes. Uh, the link for that, you guys, is ultimate nutrition system.com slash Luke. And if you use the code LUKE10, you save 10%. And then I talk about bioptimizers all the time, but I'll throw that in there too. 
Go to bioptimizers.com slash Luke. The code there is also Luke 10. And we'll put all those links in the main show notes at lukestory.com slash diet wars. I got to ask you guys, you know, you have all these tactics and strategies in here. Have you guys come up with a silver bullet hack for uh, nighttime sugar cravings? This is like my nemesis. I, I can eat a massive dinner. I'm totally full. I ate a huge steak, a bunch of potatoes, whatever. Hour goes by and I will kill someone to get some sugar. I'm, I'm wired. <laughs> I'm just, wired in a similar it's way. It's so annoying. And yeah. my wife, she has self-control around sugar. So we can, she can have it in the house and not abuse it. But if it's here, I literally, I'm like, don't do it. Don't eat the cookies. Don't eat the cookies, Luke. Don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to get fat. And there I am with my face and the cookie dough is specifically so, so my, here's, here's what I do. And my kryptonite. Wade and I learned this as trainers psychologically, it's extremely difficult to eliminate things out of your life. Like once they're a habit, once you're used to, let's say, eating cookies every night. And when they're 15 feet away. (laughs) It's it's difficult psychologically to just get rid of it completely, right? I mean, we've we've both done that with alcohol. And and the difference is if I had to drive down to Whole Foods to get some ice cream, I can resist. But if I just have to walk 15 feet to the freezer, no chance. Well, one of the things we recommend, and again, we've been doing this for a long time with our clients and now in the book, is instead of eliminating, upgrade. So, you know, Wade and I like chips. And one of our dietary tactics has been Quest chips. Quest, a bag of Quest chips that are on 150, 160 calories, 19 grams of protein. You eat two of those, you're satiated. They taste great. They've got a whole array of flavors and they're awesome. On the sweet side, I, again, Quest has these, you know, it's almost like a candy bar type. It's not their their original style. It's a newer one. They're phenomenal. So they give me that chocolate bar experience. Of course, on the ice cream side, you got Halo Top, which is a, a pretty good low calorie option. So for me, I think it's better to, again, upgrade to lower calorie, higher protein, lower sugar options than trying to fight yourself and getting rid of cookies altogether. Wait. Yeah. And for me, I don't have that self-control if it's in the house. So environment is stronger than will is something I learned from Yogananda a long time ago. And I believe that's true. You want to create a successful environment. And then I have my once a week. So usually it's UFC night and I'll do a fasting either the day before or the day after. And I go out on the Saturday afternoon before the fight. You know, I got some friends coming over because I like to eat socially as well. I go buy a ridiculous amount of snacks and all the things that are you're not supposed to have. High quality. I always still buy, like I go to Ear One and spend just stupid amounts of money. I gratefully. Re- I remember that. Gratefully. Yeah. And I have this big spread. And we go hog wild, me and my friends. And when they walk out the door, whatever's left, we hand it to them. If there's anything left, oftentimes there's not. (laughs) But if there is, it goes out the door with people. Because I know tomorrow, I'm not eating tomorrow. And psychologically, I'm not thinking of, I'm never going to eat this again. I'm just not going to eat this tomorrow. And then I know, you know, the next week, or, the, or two weeks later, or whenever the next event is, okay, that's going to be the next event. And so now I'm looking forward to those social experiences. And then to deal with yourself specific, oftentimes there's something off maybe digestively, something off psychologically or emotionally that will be triggering. And so by journaling, when those things happen, you can oftentimes see elements For example, for me, it could be an emotional aspect. Something triggered me emotionally. I want to go be by myself, turn on Game of Thrones, watch a couple of episodes and go into the zombie eating, Uh, you know, stress on the screen. And next thing you know, I've destroyed a giant bag of popcorn. I had four kombuchas. And now I'm going for the smart sweets, you know, the little, yeah, the little peach yeah, rings yeah, and dude. all that. You know? yeah, and then I'm, the smart and then, sweets, and then after that bears. point, you know, I'm now in the like, oh, well, the heck with it. You know, let's go, let's go on an ice cream raid. Because there's also a point too that you can start beating yourself up when you make those mistakes. And if you have a habit, maybe there's early trauma. 
This is where you can identify that through journaling and then use one of the psychological techniques like EFT to tap that craving out of the system. Or a simple one for cravings is sit down, lie on your back. Don't call it a craving. Just let the sensation and stay with the sensation. It was something I learned from Dr. Hawkins. And it'll dissipate after about 15 minutes. You realize it's not a local response. So there's right. often these, I remember there's him these triggers. About and that, then you yeah. do that two or three times and all of a sudden those cravings don't come back anymore. So unlocking the nervous system trip wires that are causing you to overeat or to indulge or to be in a hyper-restrictive lifestyle that's not good for your health, these things can be uncorked with the chapters on uh, emotional and psychological techniques because both of us have, have had to deal with them and we've had hundreds and hundreds of clients that have been successful in overcoming serious, serious problems in those areas. Yeah, I will recommend a silver bullet for you, which is okay. two or three capsules of blood sugar breakthrough. I don't know if you've been experimenting. No, with that. I don't have that one. Yeah, it's one of our products. You guys have a bunch of new shit I don't have. What's going there's on? A lot of, there's a lot of new stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of new stuff. But yeah, that one's actually been out for a couple of years. And what's what's in that one? Is it they got like bitter melon or it's, something it's, like that? It's an it? entire stack. Oh, okay, it's got bitter melon. It's got dehydroberberine. It's it's got a, a bunch of other incredible blood sugar optimizers. And the synergy is incredible. So my mother-in-law lost both feet due to diabetes. So we take oh, care of her. Wow. So before blood sugar breakthrough, even with insulin, we had to call the, the hospital and the ambulance because her blood sugar was around 600, which is insane. Because the insulin wasn't working, she had lost essentially all insulin sensitivity. It just wasn't working even at higher doses. Since she's been on blood sugar breakthrough, she actually, we had to reduce her dose because her blood sugar was getting too low because she's, you know, resensitized. So, and it's an incredible product, uh, of course, uh, Cros you know, Crosby. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He's a super fan of that product. He takes takes it before a pump. So try that. You can do cool. two, three capsules. That's what I was looking for. Not so much philosophy. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, give me the pill. Yeah. <laughs> so there you my, go. my dad, um, his doctor, he's 77. He, he had a major heart surgery a few years ago. And his doctor was concerned about his blood sugar was going up. And he never had blood sugar issues. And so I hung out with him for a few days and watched his diet. And I said, okay, sub out your cereal in the morning. And... Uh, take like bacon and eggs because he likes bacon and eggs. So I said, dad, eat bacon and eggs, drop the cereal, take two blood sugar breakthroughs before each of your meals. And in a matter of a couple of months, he, he just called me the other day and said, hey, I got my blood sugar results back and it's perfectly normal. They were going to put him on a medication. Wow. And he said, let me talk to my son and he might have a strategy for me. I addressed the strategy and blood sugar breakthrough was the game changer with that one dietary technique. Because sometimes... When you have a craving, like for example, if I drink a large amount of yerba mate, 12 hours later, I'll have a sugar craving. Oh, interesting. So that's unique to me. And I don't know why that is, but it's something that I've noticed. So if I have yerba mate in the morning, I make sure that eight, nine hours afterwards, I'm having a really high protein meal. And that mitigates that because for some reason... There's a drop. I don't know if it, I don't know what the specifics are. I'm sure there's some physiologist that could figure that out. I like your mate. I want to drink your mate. I don't want to have the food craving at night, so I mitigate uh, using that strategy. And I would only get that through journaling. And so journaling, which is a strategy that bodybuilders have used for years, and a lot of people, by tracking how you feel. How do I feel after a meal? How did I wake up in the morning? Am I groggy? Am I tired? Am I energized? Did I sleep well the night before? Did I have any emotional triggers that, that, and you'll start to see patterns over a two week period. And you're like, oh, I do this and I see this and, and I, I get this. And all of a sudden, things that you never imagined are triggering were the inflammatory components and you can address those on those levels. And so I, I think journaling is a really good strategy to pick off those things. Nobody knows your health better than you. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I have one last question for you guys. Now, one of the reasons I think over the years I've grown bored about talking about diets, which is why I was excited to talk to you guys about the anti-diet, yeah, right? the individual diet for you where you are in your life right now, 
but I think that um, I've interviewed so many brilliant people around issues like blue light exposure and EMF, like I'm such an EMF safety advocate. I find it frustrating sometimes because I think that the levels of EMF that we experience in the world are probably causing people as much harm in some cases as eating a crappy diet. And it's kind of like this elephant in the room and it keeps getting worse and more prevalent uh, with all the 5Gs and all that stuff happening, especially in um, metropolitan areas where it's, it's just insane. I mean, Austin, downtown Austin's insane. They have those, those 5G towers all over the streets. It's just crazy. But it's kind of one of those things that requires more discipline to fix, I think, in some ways than just like, oh, I'm going paleo or vegan or whatever it is. What are your perspectives on you know, the junk light and blue light toxicity, throwing off circadian rhythm, neurotransmitters, hormones, et cetera, and the impact of the, the insane levels of EMF that we have? Is that something you guys pay attention to all personally or have done any research on? The light's a big one because... Um, for me, and I think again, I think there's a lot of genetic variance. I'm one of these people. I think I'm sensitive to light. Like if if the lights are on, I just don't get tired at night. I can stay up till three, four in the morning. Like you know, so I need to manage light. Um, and I do think you know Huberman's suggestions of getting light in the eyes in the morning is is a game changer. On the EMF side, and again, this is just me. I sleep in a Faraday cage. Yeah, me too. Our whole but, bedroom's a Faraday cage. Yeah, but you know what? It, it uh, had zero impact on my sleep. So, and I am in a penthouse and I'd probably see like 10 Wi Fi's. So, I think some people are just, you know, more susceptible or sensitive to either light or EMF. So, I think yeah. again, you got to try you know, to. You know, it's interesting about the Faraday cage because when we moved, we built this house and moved in here. I was so excited to finally own a house because I could do all my crazy EMF shit. So, I had Brian Hoyer. Uh, come over and, and you know, we shielded the bedrooms and everything's like ironclad. You go in there with an EMF meter, it's just green lights, no beeps. But I've been tracking my sleep for years and my sleep hasn't changed as a result of mitigating the EMF, which is really interesting. Um, but, Proxi you know. Proximity is a big deal. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm in Panama, everything's built out of cement. So even though I'm seeing the Wi-Fi signal, the strength of that signal is really, really weak. So if you're literally like sleeping right next to the Wi-Fi, then that would probably impact you. I don't wear the O-ring anymore just because I tracked my sleep for 10 years, lost 40 pounds and it dropped off and I just didn't bother replacing it. But that when that was on, which again, directly against my skin and I would forget to turn on airplane mode, it seemed definitely to impact my sleep. So I, I, I live in Venice Beach and I definitely notice on a nervous system level um, the impact of EMFs because I'm really in a high EMF area as opposed to when I go to Sedona and I'm in a low EMF area and sleep quality, energy, vitality, um, the desire for stimulants. So I find that in a high EMF area, I tend to consume more stimulants. And when I'm in a low EMF area, I tend to consume less. And again, oftentimes the choices that we're making whether we know it or not, are trying to optimize out of a suboptimal situation. So a person who's tired on the road because they got low blood sugar, taking a coffee and a quick sugary drink gives them a mitigation strategy. So you're already mitigating whether you know it or not of a suboptimal situation. What we're suggesting is a set of uh, strategies and tactics that you can deploy. So EMF, yeah. And there's a huge variance between and there's a whole science around aquaporins and how the flow of electrical energy or nutrients goes through that. And you can use biohacking technology to offset that. You can have EMF reducers and all sorts of assortment devices. And at the end of the day, you got to see how you feel. Everybody should be waking up on most days feeling energized, feeling positive about the world. And at a level where they look in the mirror and they say, hey, I feel good about how I look in the mirror. And if you've got those three things going for you, the rest of this stuff becomes easy. You guys didn't mention it, but I will because I don't sell magnesium. Um, taking a lot of magnesium is a great way to mitigate yep. EMF too. Well, the, the EMF opens up calcium channels. Yeah, so it yeah. really helps with that. So he's, and also the EM, chronic EMF exposure tanks your magnesium too. So magnesium... 
vitamin C and hydrogen, those are like the three supplements I take, especially when I'm flying and in really high EMF environments. And I will take one statement back. I said my sleep scores didn't improve from being in the Faraday cage. I was already in a pretty low EMF environment back in LA. I was in Laurel Canyon. But before that, people are probably sick of hearing this story, but I was radiation poisoned legit from living unknowingly under two cell towers for three years. I was a complete train wreck. And I had insomnia there like I've never had in my life. And, you know, chronic migraines, was always getting flus and colds. My immune system was trash. So I've been directly 100% injured by chronic cell tower exposure. And to your point of the inverse square law, I was really close to them. So my sleep was horrific then. And once I moved out of there, it slowly started to improve. So I think my baseline, you know, was already pretty decent before I went to these extreme measures. But I was hoping after I did all this work, I was like, oh man, can't wait to see my sleep scores go up. And it's like, ah, eh, not really. It didn't make a huge impact being in here versus, you know, in kind of a hilly area in LA. So anyway, I wanted to make sure to mention the blue light and EMF thing because I see people get so twisted up about the food choices. And I'm like, hello, you're sleeping next to a Wi-Fi router. And it's it's one of those things where you, you can't get orthorexic and paranoid about the EMF either, which I've done. And that's not healthy either. So it's kind of like just taking incremental steps to do what we can. Like I have FLFE on the house and quantum upgrade and all, all kinds of different energetic things to help balance it. And it, it all helps, you know. Well, fellas, I want to thank you so much. I want to remind everyone to go to ultimatenutritionsystem.com slash Luke. Use your code Luke10 there. Get 10% off the book and get involved in all the stuff you guys are up to that is accompanying this book project, which sounds like an insane amount of work. So congratulations on the accomplishment of the book and everything you have to go with it. And um, thank you for bringing a fresh perspective to the world of diet wars. Much appreciated, man. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you.